Okay, well, welcome um, for newcomers. My name is Diane Kleinfelder, and I am the curator for the Captain Thomas SD Post. That's located within the Andrew Carnegie Free Library Music Hall in Carnegie. And uh, we were just discussing that this, um, uh, we started our online lectures uh, back in March and uh, probably will be continuing with online. And I have an announcement of um, our upcoming speaker, but um, I wanted to tell you, we were asked by the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Civil War Roundtable who has recently just jumped on the Zoom uh, lecture circuit to announce that they will have their first Zoom uh, lecture on Monday, September 21st. Um, it's Maine Roads to Gettysburg, and Maine is M-A-I-N-E, and their speaker is Tom Huntington. Now, uh, for to, to be able to join their meeting, you need a meeting number and a password. If you have a piece of paper uh, and a pencil, the meeting ID is 913-160-7042, and the passcode is 155-000. If you um, didn't get that, just give me a call or um, an email and I'll be glad to, to um, pass that information on to you again. Um, September is in Allegheny County, uh, Pennsylvania is Love Your Library Month. And um, we have started a, a challenge on adopting magazine subscriptions. So if you uh, donate uh, to this, the um, Jack Buncher Foundation will match one-on-one -on -one per dollar um, for us to be able to raise money. And I don't know why, but nobody has adopted our Civil War magazines. We have three up for adoption, America's Civil War, Civil War Monitor, and Civil War Times. And those adoption prices are $40. And you can actually just go online to carnegiecarnegie.org do this all through PayPal or a credit card. And in the notes field, if you want to adopt one of those magazines, um, we'd appreciate it. Again, if you want to give me a call, I'd be glad to, to uh, handle that for you. October speaker, um, and that's October the 10th, is Melissa Wynn. And Melissa is the director of photography at HistoryNet which happens to be the publishers for two of the magazines that we get, which is Civil War Times and America's Civil War. Um, she is an excellent writer and she has written a lot of um, articles. She's a great photojournalist and uh, she concentrates on uh, General John Rawlins. And the title of her talk is Grant's Conscience. And if you know the relationship of Rollins to Grant, um, he kept Grant out of trouble many times. <laughs> so Melissa is going to be joining us on Zoom on October the 10th at uh, 1 o'clock. Okay, um, today's speaker is uh, Steve Fan. Uh, Steve uh, is a historian. He resides in Washington, D.C., um, he's a military history scholar of the Civil War era, and he focuses on military occupation, operational command, and fortifications during the Civil War. He's the author of many articles and new, uh, numerous publications. He holds a master's degree in American history from Middle Tennessee State University. He's the acting chief of interpretation, Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers, National Monument for the National Park Service. And I want to um, thank Walker Evans, who's our library director. He arranges all this because I know nothing about this technology. So I'll turn it over to our speaker. And Walker, you can do your thing here. All right. Walker, am I good to go? Yes, you are. All right. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Carnegie Free Library and my friend Diane Kleinfelter for the invite to speak today. I know I was supposed to be out in Pittsburgh at this moment, and I was looking forward to being out there again. I visited Pittsburgh for the first time 
I think last year, and I really enjoyed my time out there, there are fortifications around um, Pittsburgh, as I know Rich Condon had talked about before, um, and there's a connection to the defense of the Washington here. So um, for everyone tuning in, my name is Steve Fan. I'm a historian park ranger in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Civil War Defenses of Washington is a pretty unique uh, regional program in D.C. We manage 17 sites and a national cemetery with three national parks um, around the region, or we call it the area now, which is uh, Rock Creek Park, uh, National Capital Parks East, and George Washington Memorial Parkway. So today we're going to talk about the defenses of Washington, the earthworks that were constructed to protect Washington, D.C. Uh, during the Civil War. It's a, it's a very unique uh, complex history. And I like to talk about the evolution of the defenses of Washington, uh, which coincides with what happens on the battlefields, um, especially in Virginia and Maryland. And so you're going to see that throughout the program here. So the capital can't be taken. That's a quote taken from Winfield Scott in the days following uh, the Confed Confederate bot um, bombardment, excuse me, on Fort Sumter. He was um, in a cabinet meeting with uh, Abraham Lincoln and his administration, he says, the uh, capital can't be taken. Uh, uh, Winfield Scott's duties uh, to ensure that the capital was protected as the Civil War really erupted across the landscape. So you're gonna see um, a lot of really unique historic images of Washington, D.C., of the defense of the Washington. So let's get going. So I really talk about the origins of the defenses of Washington really starts with the election of 1860 when Abraham Lincoln is elected in November of 1860. This is really going to be, it's going to, the catalyst to really cause the defenses of Washington to be necessary. And what I mean by that is by uh, December, as we know, um, South Carolina and some of the southern states will start breaking away from the Union to form the Confederacy in February of 1861. Uh, Washington, D.C. is going to be under threat from multiple sides. Um, to the south will be Virginia, to the north will be Maryland, and right in the middle you've got the federal capital. And so outgoing President James Buchanan, um, it's going to be really interesting. He's got a connection to this. He's a Pennsylvanian, as we know, and he's going to call on, there's an, uh, an image of the unfinished Capitol building during the Civil War. It will be completed during the course of the war, which I think is very symbolic of the war itself. And he's gonna call on old fuss and feathers of War of 1812 and, and Mexican war fame, Winfield Scott. Uh, Winfield Scott was actually in New York City, but he's gonna be recalled to Washington in December of 1860. And he's gonna be tasked with defending the Capitol. And also to make sure that there's a, a, trans, a safe, trans, a safe and transfer, excuse me, peaceful transfer of power from the Buchanan administration to the Lincoln administration in 1861. So how is he going to do that? Well, we know Winfield Scott's getting up in age there. He has some physical ailments. So he's going to call on Charles Stone of Ball's uh, Bluff fame. And he's going to assign him as the Inspector General of Washington, D.C. And it's going to be Stone's mission really to ensure uh, the peaceful transfer of power, especially with the inauguration coming up in March of 1861. He's going to reorganize the militias in D.C. He's going to, if the city comes under attack, he builds an, uh, a defensive structure built on the infrastructure of the city, literally the federal buildings in D.C. He's got flour and water in the basements, long enough for the buildings and the troops in the city to um, withstand a siege for about 10 to 14 days long enough for reinforcements to arrive to relieve the city. Uh, during the inauguration in March, he's actually got undercover officers or soldiers walking around in civilian clothes armed with weapons just in case. He's got cavalry vedettes roaming the city. There's cannons on the streets. There are soldiers on the rooftops. And it's effective because Abraham Lincoln will be safely and peacefully inaugurated as president in March of 1861. That's an image of the first um, Lincoln inauguration in March of 1861. So what's going to happen next, this is the most integral part of really the story and the foundation of the defenses of Washington. And it's really going to start, um, I call it the Union Shield, because the defenses of Washington will begin with soldiers, literally frontline soldiers, including um, 
90-day militia men and National Guard troops and stuff like that, to uh, the U.S. regular army that's being uh, recalled all the way out west to volunteer units that will comprise the majority of the armies as we know during the Civil War. And there's a map of Washington, D.C. there. And um, this is an 1862 map. You can already see the dots on there, which, which represent the defenses of Washington. So I want to take it back to April and May of 1861. Um, we got Fort Sumter in April, of course. But uh, for the federal engineers and officers in Washington, the main threat is right here, which is Northern Virginia. Um, they called it the Arlington Heights during that period. And so the great fear from the US Army and the, the War Department and the Lincoln administration is what's going to happen to Virginia? If Virginia does indeed secede from the Union, they're very fearful that the Confederate Army can roll up artillery and shell the federal city. And so think of the Arlington National Cemetery, the Lee Mansion, the Lee Memorial. Imagine having artillery on top of that hill you can easily just pummel the city from that point. So there's going to be uh, federal engineers basically reconnoitering all the ground around Washington, um, D.C. D.C. is kind of a bowl, and you've got all this high ground around it, especially here and also here as well. Uh, um, this is the, we call it the Anacostia River today. They called it the Eastern Branch or Eastern Branch of the Potomac, and that's important to understand as we move forward in the program here. So what's going to happen, my friends? Well, federal troops, um, once they hear that Virginia will indeed vote for secession, the U.S. Army will cross the Potomac River on the evening of May 23rd, 1863. In three separate columns, they're going to come across. You can see the columns right here, one, two, and there's going to be another bridge as well. Three separate columns, and they're going to occupy Arlington Heights, which you can see right there, the star. There's also going to be some transport ships that move men to Alexandria as well. So the goal is to secure um, Arlington and then this really important rail center and city, which will be Ale Alexandria, Virginia. So that will occur on the evening of May 23rd, 1861. And why is this so important? Well, it's gonna be up to Joseph K. Mansfield. He's actually in charge of the Department of Washington. And uh, we know he's mortally wounded at the Battle of Antietam. But he's the one that um, tells the War Department, he tells Winfield Scott, we have to seize the initiative. Um, this ground is too vulnerable. The city is vulnerable unless we take the high ground. And he's going to rely on um, his engineers to do that. So Irvin McDowell <clears throat> will command the Army of Occupation the following day, and he'll make his headquarters at the Arlington House. OK, so there's a very cool account from the Evening Star. And I want, to, I want to read it to you. And this is written, uh, and this is going to be talking about the next day. At, at 4 o'clock this morning, a large number of government wagons went across Long Bridge loaded with picks and shovels and all manner of tools and accompanied with a full corps of carpenters and workmen. And then you can see the rest of the quote there. The United States forces are now busily throwing up fortifications on the heights on the Virginia shore. So that's interesting to understand, uh, important to understand, excuse me. A lot of people believe that the fortifications were built after the Battle of Bull Run or First Manassas, and the majority of them were, but there was a small foundation of around six forts that were, five to six forts that were uh, built in May and June of 1861. I call them forward operating bases. The, the Federal Army could have a presence in Northern Virginia. They could cover the high ground. And they could also move men and supplies across from um, uh, Washington, D.C. And then the field army, the Army of Northeastern Virginia, under Irvin, Irvin McDowell, can advance um, and engage, uh, which will lead to the first major battle of the Civil War. So the forts go up in May of 1861, and this will continue to evolve all the way until 1865. So you can see this kind of cool image here, uh, sketch of soldiers using shovels and things like that to build the defenses of Washington, which are earthworks. Uh, they're all made out of earth. Um, they were cheap um, and they, you could put them up quite easily. So the soldiers would uh, cut down trees and they would use shovels and picks and things like that to 
pile up walls um, of dirt and to create these fortifications. Um, one of my historian friends calls this an excavation. In many ways it is. They're really taking dirt and building up huge uh, walls to create these fortifications. Um, here's a sketch of Fort Runyon, which basically sits where the Pentagon is today. It was the largest fort built um, during, uh, throughout the entire defenses of Washington. And you can kind of see the walls right there. This is all made out of earthworks there. And um, you can see the Potomac River right there in the background. Okay, so this is a historic image, a uh, very, uh, very um, complex, very uh, interesting image. This is Alexandria, Virginia. You can see the fort sitting right on top of the hill there. I think everyone can see that. That's Fort Ellsworth. The Masonic Temple sits on top of it. Now you can see the flag right there. So they're building forts on strategic high grounds, avenues of approach to these major cities and thoroughfares. And as I said, the forts will evolve over the course of the war, meaning they will be enlarged. They're gonna add larger guns to them um, and other things as well. And we'll talk about that moving forward in the program. Um, this is in uh, excuse me, Arlington. This is called um, Fort Corcoran, one of the major forts as a part of the Virginia line here. You can see it's kind of a stockade with these wooden posts there. It was a mix of dirt and wood in many cases. And then you can see the stacks of wood on the outside. Um, I call that 19th century barbed wire. They called it Abati. So we'll talk about Abati in a second here. I see Father Bob like that reference there. So he, he kind of smiled a bit. And so what's going to happen next? Well, it's going to be come to this dashing fellow, um, especially after the Battle of First Manassas or Bull Run, when the Union Army retreats to Washington, Winfield Scott orders the men to retreat to the protection of the fort's guns. So already some of the fortifications are, are really doing their job. And when he arrives in late July, um, this is when you're gonna see the next major evolution of the defenses of Washington under the supervision of Major General George McClellan. And I call this the art of fortification. And you're gonna hear his name a lot. He was actually, according to Rich Condon, was sent out to Pittsburgh to oversee the design and construction of the defenses of Pittsburgh during the Civil War. This is uh, John G. Barnard. He was a Brigadier General, a career engineer, an absolutely brilliant man, um, a West Pointer. Um, he was actually assigned to the staff of uh, uh, Joseph K. Mansfield um, early in spring of 1861. And he's gonna be one of the guys reconnoitering the ground here. So he's gonna be assigned as the chief engineer of the defenses of Washington. So we call him um, St. Barnard. He's the... Uh, He's the, the father of the defenses of Washington in many ways. And he's gonna work with other army engineers to oversee the design and construction of an elaborate system of fortifications. And I kind of had to blow this picture up here, but you can see the soldiers creating an ex excavation. They're cutting down trees and they're just piling up dirt to build these walls. And so the earthworks in a way are gonna be hard to maintain because of the weather in and around Washington. Um, but it was easy for the men to really build these fortifications. And it's really important to understand that these are only temporary. They're going to build these fortifications and maintain them during the course of the uh, rebellion. And once the war is over, they're going to, the majority of these forts will be destroyed. Um, it's important to understand that a lot of these forts were built, were built on civilian property. Uh, the U.S. Army uh, stated, uh, military necessity. We have to defend the capital. So they came on in, they occupied really important um, landscapes. They cut down trees and they started building fortifications. Okay, so Father Bob will like this image here. Um, this is what these forts looked like. This is kind of a, a side view and a bird's eye view of kind of how these forts are designed. And you can see the unique features here. We've got the, and you can still, you can see um, the forts built on the high ground the ground is sloping up here. And so that imagine if you're a def, uh, attacker, you're acting going uphill over open ground and you're gonna be taking a lot of um, enemy fire from artillery, but also small arms as well. You've got the Abati there, which will slow down the attackers. And then you've got the ditch itself, which was up to six feet deep. 
Uh, when I explain this to children in education groups, I say, I ask them what's on the outside of a castle and they say a moat, exactly. It's a moat, but it's uh, dry. Um, and then you've got the parapet, rampart and um, other features of the fort. The bomb proof is where the soldiers would stay if they were under enemy fire. There was also um, magazines within the forts themselves where they could um, store the ammunition and gunpowder. The embrasures are where the cannons are sticking out of the walls, okay? So that's kind of a bird's eye view of what the defenses of Washington will look like. And here's another example of, uh, this is an engineering sketch of Fort Lyon in Virginia here. And you can see all shape, all the forts are shaped a little bit differently. I'll point out a few things again. We've got the Abit around uh, the fort. We've got the Sally Port, which is the entrance. You've got this really large bomb proof here. As you can see, because the middle of the fort is, is open. So if the enemy is lobbing artillery shells, it's a way for the infantry and the gunners to get in the forts if necessary. And then you've got the magazines itself. These are basically dug into the ground. That's where the ammunition and gunpowder powder will be stored at. And it's important to understand the soldiers themselves did not live in the forts. They lived on encampments around the forts. And here's an example of a really important fort in uh, Northwest DC near Tenley Town. It was called Fort Pennsylvania and it was renamed Fort Reno after Jesse Reno. And one of the things I love about this image, which I found on the Library of Congress here, is you can see all these different letters and numbers, excuse me, numbers here, and it tells you what they are. So like number 10 is a wagon's tent. Uh, you've got the officer's stable hospital apartment. So this is gonna occupy acres and acres of land. I refer them to as Olympic villages. You've got the main fort itself, and then you've got all the different support structures. You've got cookhouses and tents and officer tents and sutler shops. Every fort really had its own kind of um, uh, infrastructure to maintain it, okay? Okay, so this is probably my favorite image of the defenses of Washington. When people ask me, can you send me an image of what the defenses of Washington look like? This is one of them. This is Fort Slummer in Northeast Washington. It's um, on private property, actually a part of the Catholic University of America. Actually, it was a relatively small sized fort. It had a, a perimeter of less than 100 yards, but look how dramatic the fort is, right? When we talk about earthworks and you see these walls here, those are earthworks. Uh, they are revetted or they've got revetments. These are these wooden, uh, either horizontal posts or wooden planks that reinforce the walls. Uh, and because you imagine there's a lot of deterioration with weather and things like that. Uh, you got the Sally Port right here where the soldiers are marching in and out of. You've got the artillery posted um, on top. Basically, this is looking north into Maryland, by the way. So you can see the landscapes changed dramatically since that point. And then you've got the Abati right there. And you can even see the dry ditch. So this is an absolutely incredible image. Um, and I, if I recall, this is the second Pennsylvania heavy artillery. So another Keystone State connection to the defenses of Washington. So if you want me to send you this image, I can send it to the library and you can share it with the folks there. Okay, so I was talking about the encampments around Washington. Um, this is Fort Bunker Hill, right on top of the hill there. And you can tell this is an early war image, my friends, because of these really large Sibley tents. So this is likely late 61 into early 1862 where the soldiers will stay at. And the ones who originally built the forts are the Army of the Potomac, the men that will form the nucleus of the Army of the Potomac that will serve, serve with George McClellan in 1862 and so forth. Um, when the army goes off to fight the Peninsula Campaign, they will, they will, they'll be replaced by other troops. And then as we go further into the war, you'll have a mix of soldiers and civilians uh, building new forts and expanding the original ones, including formerly enslaved African-Americans. And I'll talk about that in a second. And you can see a very famous image from the 31st PA. This is near Queens Farm, near Fort Bunker Hill. So we, we know this is an early war image. I see Diane kind of shaking her head because I think a lot of people have seen this image, a fantastic early war image. And you can see the family, you can see the dog right there, a very, very cool early war image of camp life in Washington, DC. And so what does camp life turn into? Cabin life. And these are some 
pretty cool barracks. This is actually at Fort Stevens. Um, this is going to be located behind the fort itself, the main fort. And you can see the soldiers will end up spending quite a bit of time. There's these heavy artillery uh, units. And the, so they're going to build barracks, mess halls, kitchens, hospitals. This is a part of um, Fort Stevens. So you can see it's not a not too bad of a gig if you want to serve in the Civil War, right? I wouldn't, you know, if I was going to serve in the Civil War, would I be on the front line or would I want to be hanging out in Washington, D.C.? A lot of soldiers preferred staying in the Washington, D.C., and you can see why. So the entire circumference of the city was thus protected. That's George McCollin. So let me give you some numbers here for the ones that are joining us. Uh, by the end of 1861, there's going to be 48 forts encircling Washington um, in Virginia and uh across Maryland as well. That number will increase to about 60 by 1863. By the end of 1864 and 1865, there's gonna be 68 forts, major forts encircling Washington, DC. So when we talk about one of the most heavily fortified cities in the world, that's what we're talking about from four or 500 artillery pieces to over 700 artillery pieces by the end of the Civil War. So large fortifications and really, really big cannons. Okay, so you're going to see some things change in the defenses of Washington. I mentioned at the beginning the evolution of the defenses of Washington. Remember I showed you that image of Fort Pennsylvania and the sketch of Fort Pennsylvania? Well, what's going to happen is the forts will evolve starting in late 1862, moving into 1863 and beyond. And that has to do with what happens on the battlefield. So the original sector of uh, most immediate threat was Virginia, uh, uh, the northern defenses along Arlington all the way down to Alexandria. And that's will shift to Maryland um, because Robert E. Lee, uh, during this time, September of 1862, he'll invade Maryland and start the Maryland campaign. And that's when engineers and officers in DC are like, oh no, he could march south and attack the northern defenses. So uh, the forts on the Virginia side were bigger uh, or more condensed or more forts. Uh, the forts in uh, northern, uh, on the northern defenses along Maryland were smaller and there was fewer of them. So you're going to see the expansion of the forts in 1862 and 1863. So Fort Pennsylvania, also called later called Fort Reno, is right here. You can see the where I'm pointing the, the arrow here. And in 1863, they're going to add this section right here. This is called Battery Reno. Uh, battery, they, they started adding batteries or artillery positions to uh, cover blind spots within the line of the defenses of Washington and also to fully connect the forts as well. The majority of the forts will be built 800 to 1,000 yards apart and they'll be connected by rifle pits. Often put in those rifle pits will be these artillery positions. They call them batteries. Uh, the majority of them were unarmed uh, meaning if the city came under attack, the forts came under attack, they can move uh, field artillery to mount the guns to support the forts, okay? So we're talking about forts, batteries, and earthworks or rifle pits. So you can see the main fort here, and this addition was added in 1863. So this is Fort Reno, this is Battery Reno, and you're going to get a better idea with this next image, okay? So you've got Fort Reno, You've got Battery Reno, and you've got all the connecting earthworks here. So you've got a battery here. You've got another fort, which is Fort Kearney, Battery Terrell, and some more batteries that will connect to the next fort, which is Fort Jerusi. Does that make sense? So you've got the major forts, and in between, you've got smaller earthworks to protect the, the spaces in between. So when we're talking about the entire circumference of the city is protected. That's what we're talking about. We've got the major forts, we've got earthworks connecting them, we've got batteries, and we've got more batteries and then other forts as well. That's how these things work. So if the attacker, as the Confederate Army found out in 1863, when they advance towards Washington, they're going to take fire from multiple forts and batteries at the same time. That's how these forts are built, to provide mutual battery support to one another. Okay, and this is one of our sites actually that we manage in Washington, D.C. This um, is in Tenleytown. It actually oversees Chain Bridge. There's going to be forts on the other side of Chain Bridge. And then you've got 
these massive 100 pound parrot rifles lobbing 100 pound shells aimed directly at the bridge if necessary. So you've got forts and batteries um, doing pretty much doing the same thing, protecting one another and protecting main um, uh, approaches to the city as well. So very, very large guns, about 15 to 16 100 pound parrot rifles were mounted later on in the war. Okay, so one of my favorite images, this is in Washington DC, this is one of our sites. And I think you can see the walls there. This is one of the batteries that was built in Rock Creek Park or in Rock Creek, we now know it as Rock Creek Park. And you can see right there, embrasure, 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 six embrasures, meaning a full uh, Union or Army um, our, um, you know, battery could basically bring up guns, reverse them and put them into place all through the line here. So this is what we have here today. These are actually in incredible condition. And so when we talk about batteries, we're talking about these unarmed artillery positions, okay? I love this site, by the way. Okay, and here's another battery. I showed you battery, uh, battery tarot um, earlier. We're very fortunate, and Diane, you'll really appreciate this. Um, I think people can see that there's a building in the background. Uh, this is private uh, property. We were allowed to go and visit. This is the Peruvian ambassador's residence in DC. And he's got a Civil War earthwork in front of his house. Okay, so we were very fortunate to go off and see this. This um, oversees one of the, the valleys in Rock Creek. Um, and Rock Creek Park goes right up to his property there. So uh, I, I believe he's retired now, but he allowed us and uh, our friends group to go and visit a couple years ago. And you can see it's in an immaculate condition and uh, kind of an inside story here. He was, a, he was such a great gentleman, so welcoming. And apparently his assistant told us that he signs every letter from the um, residence home of Battery Terrell. <laughs> so we're very grateful for that. Um, as I said, it's private. Um, Private property, of course, uh, we were able to get a special invite and hopefully we'll be able to do another special program out there within another year or so. Okay, they also built block houses. Um, you, you, you see more block houses out in like the state of Tennessee for the Union Army to protect the rail stations and things like that. Uh, but there were a few uh, block houses that were built around um, uh, the defenses of Washington as well. And bridges. So this is Chain Bridge. It's funny because it's one of the, um, in um, Northwest DC, it's a really easy access point, a very busy access point into Washington DC. And there are, um, it was a guarded bridge because they were fearful that, especially Confederate Cav horsemen could dash across the bridge. Um, so there was this, uh, a, an iron gate at the end of the bridge and there was also troops here. And check out this next image. They also had cannons sitting right on top of the bridge. Okay, so literally every approach to the city, every bridge, every, you know, trail, whatever you want to say was covered by some sort of um, defensive position there. Okay, so we talked about the defensive south of the Potomac right here. They call this the Arlington Line, Arlington, Virginia. It extends all the way down to um, Alexandria. And as I said, this was the main sector. Um, in the early stages of the war, it will shift to this side, which I call the Northern Defenses. You can see Maryland's right there. And this is what they call the Eastern Branch Line, Eastern Branch of the Potomac uh, River right there. And you can see all the forts are shaped a little bit differently, right? Uh, they built the forts, um, basically adhering, um, building them to the ground that they're sitting on. So you can see all different shapes and forms here. Very, very large. We showed Fort Runyon earlier. You can see how big that fort is sitting really where the Pentagon is and where Long Bridge was. One of the major crossings of the Potomac River there. Sport C of Smith. Uh, and Fort C of Smith is actually uh, managed by Arlington County Parks and Recs. They've done a really good job there. They've got some earthworks and they've got a, a visitor center as well that's open on the weekend. So I would suggest checking that out. This is Fort uh, Richardson named after Israel Richardson. In Virginia, you can see the early war image with all the tents in the background there. Uh, this is Fort Marcy, uh, right off the GW Parkway, and this is managed by uh, the National Park Service. Okay, so this is going to be, the, I, you know, I guess this is going to become the most important sector of the line because this is going to be 
the section that we'll see action in July of 1864 when Jubal Early advances towards Washington, DC. And you can see the forts are much smaller on this side. And you're gonna see some additions though. We talked about the additional battery there at Fort Reno. The forts themselves are enlarged as well, including Fort Stevens, and we'll talk about that in a second. And you can see the Eastern Branch Line that's on the Anacostia River. Okay, my friends, so this is Fort Stevens in 1865. This is gonna be the main focus of the Confederate um, advance on Washington on July 11th and 12th, 1864. For those of you familiar with Silver Spring, Maryland, that's Silver Spring, Maryland. So a very dramatic view of the countryside during the Civil War. As you can see, it's very open space here. The soldiers knocked down a lot of the trees in front of the forts and they did a lot of target practice throughout their week. So all the guns were ranged. And so up to a thousand yards out, a couple miles actually, if you advance towards the city, you will be taking fire from long range Union artillery. And so pay attention to this tree right here, my friends. We'll talk about that in the Battle of Fort Stevens at the end of the program. Okay, one of the most dramatic images of the defenses of Washington. Um, if you've been to Washington, D.C. and you've used and you have used the metro station, you might have heard of Fort Totten train station. Everyone thinks of the metro station. It was actually named after Fort Totten, which is right here. And this is the 100 pound Parrot rifle. We were talking about those earlier. Um, this was mounted in 1863. And this will be engaged um, during the Battle of Fort Stevens. Fort Stevens is off in this direction over here. It's gonna be firing to the Northwest to support Fort Stevens during the battle here. So imagine there's gonna be a crisscross from different forts and Fort Stevens is right in the middle. So as I said, if you attack one fort, you're taking fire to the front of you and from both flanks. That's why these forts are so, um, so strong in many ways. Uh, and look how open the landscape is. That's, that's, that's Maryland. And you can also see the wooden uh, posts that uh, are reinforcing the walls. You can see the abatee on the outside of the ditch there. This is actually an amazing image you can see gun number 13 as well. So we know exactly where this gun was located. And this is near Bladensburg, this is Fort Lincoln. You can see um, some properties in the background there. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show this is you can see the 100 pound parrot rifle in, this, in the right part of the screen here. So all these guns were added in 1863. So it really shows you the evolution of the defenses of Washington. And here's an, a really great image of Fort Lincoln. You can see the interior structures um, of the fortification. I love the soldiers standing as a sentinel right there. And then of course, each fort had a flag there. So this is what the defenses of Washington looked like. Okay, this is one of the, um, I believe this is one of the magazines at, where they stored the ammunition at uh, Fort Totten. And look at that image there. So the soldiers had a lot of time on their hands. And so they got a little artistic with the sally ports there. And you can see, um, yeah, you got the really cool um, sign that goes right across the top um, as the soldiers could enter the fort there. Okay, this is the last section here. And you can see uh, Washington DC right here. So this section went up specifically to guard um, this high ground right here or protect this high ground um, because the, the federal arsenal and the US Navy Yard was on this side. So they were fearful that the Confederates would shell the Navy Yard and the federal arsenal. So they built um, a line of fortifications on this side of the Anacostia River. And this is Fort Carroll. And what I mean by evolution, you can see the ditch right here. This bastion was added later on in the war. So uh, think of the star-shaped forts that you might have seen before. Um, meaning if the enemy attacked this section of the wall, they would take front fire and they also take flank fire as well. That's why they added these. So a lot of the bastions or bastion nets, even three-sided walls were added uh, later on in the war here. Uh, and on the side also, they had the Geesboro Horse Depot uh, west of um, Fort Carroll and it produced hundreds of thousands of horses for the federal armies during the war, mostly for the Army of the Potomac. So. I mean, really, this is the, you know, 
this is really the, the heartbeat of the federal war effort. Men, material, troops, whatever you need is coming from Washington, D.C. The supplies, the War Department, the administration, Army headquarters, all is based in Washington, D.C. And you understand why they allocated so many resources to protect it. Okay, so this is what I mean by the expansion of the defense of the Washington in 1863, 64, even 1865. So we talked about the addition of these 100 pound parrot rifles. This is the same um, image, uh, same view, or same um, gun from Fort Tonda, excuse me. Okay, so this is really important to understand. So my friends, this is a model of Fort Stevens where the main attack will occur when the Confederate advances towards DC on the 11th and 12th of July, 64. And you can basically see two forts here. The original fort, can you see that, is right there. Very small shaped kind of fort right there, less than a 200 yard perimeter. Uh, it was renamed Fort Stevens after Isaac Stevens. Everything you see here was expanded upon. So the original fort, the additional fort, it was almost a 400 yard perimeter, it almost doubled the size of the fort. So when, I, when we talk about the evolution, we talk about a massive expansion of the forts themselves which will become, which will really be important as the Confederate Army advances towards DC because you got bigger forts, more guns and bigger guns as well. So original fort, expansion of Fort Stevens. And you're also going to see the protection of the Potomac River. This is um, Battery Rogers outside of Alexandria. And these are the largest guns in the federal arsenal, my friends. You've got the massive 15 inch Rodman gun. These guns, by the way, could fire 400 pound rounds and penetrate Confederate ironclad gunships. They were designed to knock out the Confederate Navy if they steamed up the Potomac River. And the second gun you see there is the 200 pound Parrot rifle, 200 pounder. I mean, massive guns. How big are these guns? Uh, this is Fort Foot, by the way. This is built on the Maryland side near Fort Washington, Maryland, actually. And this is one of the sites we manage in the Park Service. And I, You'll appreciate this next image here. That's how big the guns are. Massive, massive artillery pieces, okay? And these guns were state of the art at the time. And the fort I'm standing at, as I said, is Fort Foot. It will be in uh, service until about 1873, 1874, because they started experimenting with these guns um, as like the next evolution of coastal defense. So yes, that's sure, she sure is a beauty. We have two of those down at Fort foot. And also at Fort Foot, some of the forts actually, we talked about um, the magazines where they stored the ammunition. Most of them were built um, into the ground with uh, horizontal wooden posts, uh, cedar posts, and then covered with sod and things like that. Um, but uh, some of the forts, they got a bit creative. And this is at Fort, um, this is at Fort Stanton. You, they had some German engineers come in to build these um, brick magazines. How immaculate are those? So this is 160 years later. This is where they would have stored the ammunition. So you can see on the outside, it's going to be covered up with, you know, invasive plants and weeds and stuff like that. If you look inside, this is what you're going to find. Okay, so who's in DC? Well, originally, uh, we've got a lot of National Guard or militia men, 98 men, including the 7th uh, New York um, Volunteers are, excuse me, uh, militia, including Robert Gould Shaw, who stayed in DC for a bit. Got different images of the camps around Washington. Uh, Second Rhode Island, this is near Fort uh, Slocum. And this is important to understand. You can see the images of the African American, uh, literally boys and young men. Over the course of the war, about 40 to 50,000 enslaved African Americans seek refuge in Washington, DC. Uh, we, you know, we call them contraband camps. There's contraband camps dotting the city, the landscape, including uh, they, they have an, a contraband village over by Arlington National Cemetery. They have an island, um, Theodore Roosevelt Island. There's gonna be a contraband camp there. And many of these uh, men and their families will be brought into the city and they'll start, um, they'll find employment um, with the defenses of Washington, with the US Army um, in DC during the war. And then a, a lot of the men will enlist with the United States Colored Troops as well. And uh, I believe this is Fort C.F. Smith. You can see this, the soldiers, uh, the officers had some pretty nice quarters there. This is Fort, I'm trying to remember where this is at. It might be Richardson. 
And one of my favorite images, this is the Treasury Department guard. And Diane, can you see the Washington Monument in the background? So this is that, that basically the National Mall. So you have all different types of troops in the city. The Treasury Department guard, I don't, I'm not sure how well they would have stood up against Robert E. Lee's veterans, right? Uh, but we've got an assortment of troops in and around Washington, DC. Oh, I'll show that one again. And then as, as I said, 1863, you're gonna see the enlistment of United States Colored Troops. The first regiment United States Colored Troops will be organized and raised in DC on Theodore Roosevelt Island. And I think a lot of people have seen this image. Uh, this is the fourth USCT. I think this is, uh, this is probably my favorite image of black soldiers during the Civil War. This is at Fort Lincoln in 1865. So a lot of, uh, after Lee's surrender, a lot of the, um, the white units were mustered out of federal service. A lot of the black units had signed three-year enlistments and were kept around until 1866. So a lot of the forts um, in 1865, 66 were uh, garrisoned by black soldiers. So I, I know a lot of people have seen this image, but this is in DC at the defenses of Washington. And you can see a uh, really cool image. This is uh, apparently a unit of the Veteran Reserve Corps. A lot of those units served in DC. That's the monument to George Washington. So like a Washington kind of circle in DC. And National Guard troops. So uh, there were a lot of troops uh, organized in 1864 for temporary service. They signed 100 year, uh, uh, excuse me, 100 day enlistments. And a lot of them will be garrisoning the forts of DC as General Grant um, embarks on his uh, Overland campaign. He'll strip the forts of about 25 to 30,000 men and they'll be replaced by the Veteran Reserve Corps and uh, National Guard troops as well. And so these National Guard troops will actually be in action uh, during uh, the Battle of Fort Stevens. Okay, so let's talk about the Battle of Fort Stevens. 1864, the Confederate Army will advance towards Washington, D.C. Uh, we talk about the Battle of Monocacy a lot because uh, it occurred uh, on July 9th, 1864. It's a national park site outside of Frederick, Maryland. Um, the famous Lou Wallace of um, Ben-Hur fame was there. Um, and he's gonna make an epic stand on the banks of the Monocacy River. He'll slow down the Confederate army long enough for General Grant to send up reinforcements from Virginia to reinforce the defenses of Washington. So. This is the famous battle where um, they arm government clerks, civilians, and send them to the front line. They'll empty hospitals and anyone that can carry a weapon, they're gonna send them to the front line. So this is, and this is also the famous battle where Abraham Lincoln will be under enemy fire. Okay, so the battle um, occurs on July 11th, 1864, and, and the 12th, excuse me, so 11th and 12th. And I'll give you a general overview. The Confederate Army, there's a force of 10 to 15,000 men under um, Lieutenant General Juba Early, and he's sent up to clear the Shenandoah Valley and then advance uh, across the Potomac River. And he's kind of got pretty open orders there. He can march into Pennsylvania, he can threaten Baltimore, he can threaten DC. By July 4th, 5th, you know, he's crossed the river and he's uh, basically ransoming towns in Southern Maryland. And, you know, by the end of the first week, that's when the Federal High Command finally reacts. And that's when they're going to send up reinforcements to Washington, D.C. They literally send the 6th Army Corps, elements of the 19th Corps on river transports. They arrive at the Potomac River and then march them all the way up to Fort Stevens to reinforce the defenses. And they get here just in time because the Confederate Army gets to within about 100 yards of Fort Stevens. Uh, in the early afternoon of July 11th before they're forced back. Okay, so here's a really great image of Fort Stevens as well. Okay, the 7th Street Road. For those of you that know DC, we call that Georgia Avenue now. I, um, I live pretty close to Georgia Avenue. The Confederate Army is coming from Silver Spring, Maryland, and they're going to run right into Fort Stevens. And the forts around it, including Fort Slocum to the east, and Fort um, Darusi to the west. And as you can see there, President Lincoln, we believe he's actually at the battle both days on the 11th for a short amount of time. When he hears that the Sixth Corps, you can see the Sixth Corps flag right there. When the Sixth Corps arrives, he actually rides all the way down to the Potomac River to welcome the troops into the city. 
And then he um, comes back on the 12th, and this is one he's actually under fire. There's going to be a, a federal surgeon standing next to him. Who will, he will be severely wounded in the leg. And this is the famous scene where someone yells to him, get down, you fool. Get down, you damn fool. There are at least a dozen people who have claimed to tell Lincoln to get down, you fool. So, um, you know, everyone wants to be connected to Abraham Lincoln, but he was um, under fire during the battle. So here's a better, um, really great map from the uh, American Battlefield Trust um, of the Battle of Fort Stevens. You can see Rock Creek right here going south all the way down to the Potomac River. You've got Silver Spring, Maryland on top there. And then you've got the defenses of Washington. You've got Fort DeRussi. You've got Fort Stevens right in the center. And you've got Fort Slocum. We already showed you the huge cannons at Fort Totten. And so imagine, you can see the Confederate Army. These are their skirmishers. They advance on both sides of Georgia Avenue. They're taking fire here. They're taking fire here. They're taking fire here, even here. So four different forts, e even in this section, are going to be firing on the Confederate Army. By the end of July 11th, it's pretty much over for Juba Early. And he realizes that, especially with the arrival, you can see, of, of the Sixth Corps under Horatio Wright. They're going to fill in the line here. Once the veterans arrive, he's got no chance to break through the defenses here. Um, but the battle does not end there. On July 12th, around 6 o'clock, uh, a couple of brigades of the Sixth Corps will attack. You can see it right there. They're going to be under the command of Frank Wheaton, and they're going to attack um, to drive the Confederate Army out of Washington, D.C. The majority of the casualties occurred by the Federal Army will occur north of Fort Stevens. And you can also see, my friends, right there, Battleground National Cemetery. That's my office. So I'm sitting right on top of the battlefield there. I'm very fortunate, very cool. And Wheaton, by the way, uh, that there was a, uh, the Confederate Army came through the town of Leesboro. Um, the, uh, the citizens of Wheaton renamed, uh, Leesboro renamed the town Wheaton. So we, we now know it as Wheaton, Maryland. Okay, so let's talk, uh, the battle will conclude and that will be pretty much be the end of major action in the defense of the Washington. So what happens after the Civil War? Well. We call it the guns fall silence. As I said, the majority of forts will be built on civilian property. They're gonna remove the guns and anything of value. They'll auction off a lot of property and the majority of the forts will be destroyed mostly by the civilian landowners after the Civil War. And here's a really great image of Fort Stevens around 1911. Look at the walls, right? All the wooden planks have been taken out. The, wall, the trees have grown back through the walls. And you can see there's um, a, a boulder marking the spot where Lincoln was uh, shot at. That was dedicated in 1911. So that uh, kind of approximates the, the date of this image here. But look how much the forts have deteriorated over the years, right? This is just a span of about 50 years. And you can see the dedication. Um, you can see it November 7th, 1911. They took this boulder actually near Walter Reed, uh, where, where Walter Reed was later built on the battlefield here. And that marks the spot where the president was under fire. Elizabeth Proctor Thomas was the African-American uh, woman that owned the property uh, where Fort Stevens was built. And she, was in, she became like the local heroine of the battle. And um, she's joined by Union and Confederate veterans uh, in 1911. And probably here's my favorite image, one of my favorite image. This is the Civilian Conservation Corps rebuilding Fort Stevens in 1937 and 1938. So what we have here today is a section of Fort Stevens and it was rebuilt by the CCC. So a really cool connection to FDR and um, the New Deal and the Great Depression. Okay, so starting in the 1890s, um, city planners wanted to create something called Fort Drive. The idea was to create this grand boulevard around Washington DC where um, the public could go out and enjoy history and see, um, in nature, right? Take out their carriages and things like that. And you can see the blue, um, excuse me, the dark line that encircles the city there, starting near Tenley Town, it would go all the way through the Northern defenses, crosses um, the Anacostia River all the way down to the Southeast. So they had this idea called Fort Drive, started in the 1890s and they really tried to get it going over the next 50 or 60 years, but with funding issues like that, it never really came to fruition. But a really important aspect of this in the 1930s, beginning in the 1930s, they started uh, acquiring a lot of these properties 
um, where the forts were, um, where, where these forts were at. So a lot of those forts today are managed by the Park Service. And let me show you what this looks like. So we have the original fort drive idea. And this is what we have in the National Park Service here today. So everything that you see in blue is managed by the National Park Service. You see that line? It pretty much mirrors it, right? So there's not one road that fully connects all the forts here, but the idea of Fort Drive actually does live on. Um, some of the roads around the forts are called Fort Drive, but you can see it here. Starts around here. I mean, I guess you could go Fort Marcy across the Potomac through Tenley Town and Fort Stevens, Northeast across the, this section here, all the way paralleling uh, the Anacostia River. So this is all managed by us here today. Um, Fort Ward and Fort Ethan Allen are managed um, by, um, oh, well, Fort Ethan Allen is uh, uh, Alexandria, Fort Ethan Allen and C.S. Smith is Arlington. And there's some forts managed um, um, by Fairfax County as well. So there's close to about 30 fortifications and earthworks that are still around here today. Okay, so there's a wonderful sunshot image of Fort Stevens, and you can see, my friends, everything's been built up around it, right? So we have, we're very fortunate to have this. Um, we've got all these buildings and mostly residents and some businesses as well. And then we've got uh, recreated Fort Stevens itself. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that tree at Fort Stevens. That's where the boulders at. Uh, that's where Lincoln apparently was under fire during the Battle of Fort Stevens. Okay, so then and now, you had this dramatic complex system of fortifications, 68 forts, 93 batteries, seven to 800 art, uh, 100 artillery pieces. Then, and this is what we have now, and you know, thinking about DC and how much it's developed in Northern Virginia, we're actually very fortunate to have a lot of these sites. And this is what they look like today. So this is one of our main sites. It, it reminds me of uh, some of the images that uh, Rich might have shown um, about the defenses of Pittsburgh here. This is uh, in Rock Creek Park. This is Fort Jerusi. Uh, this is Fort Marcy here. You can still see a portion of the wall there in an artillery piece. And this is my office, Battleground National Cemetery, one of the smallest national cemeteries um, in the country. Um, there's uh, 40 soldiers originally interred there, a veteran as well, and four members of the caretaker's family that were buried after the war. So that's it. I appreciate the time. I'd be um, happy to take questions or comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Walker, do you want to explain how to ask questions? Certainly, yes. If you are connected to the Zoom call, um, you can uh, just let me know that you, you have a question. Either you know, wave your hand in, in your video feed um, or um, unmute yourself. Um, if, if you let me know, then I will unmute you. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, you're welcome to type your question into the comments box uh, to the right hand side of the video. Um, and once you do that, I will read it out loud um, and so that Steve can answer any questions from Facebook. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll say, you know, we um, obviously we can do it this year, but we do a commemoration of Fort Stevens every July. Um, we do, uh, do a lot of programming, obviously. It's a little bit different now with COVID, but we're doing a lot of uh, online digital media. So uh, we got a lot of stuff on our Facebook page. We have an Instagram page uh, and our website as well. I can provide all that information. I, I like to dress up and hang out with the kids sometimes. And you can see we do, uh, especially during the fall and winter time, the best time to see earthworks. Um, and we're hoping, you know, maybe by the end of the year, um, early 2021, we'll be able to get, get out in the field again. So if you're ever in DC and you want to um, see the defenses of Washington, just let me know. I'd be happy to take you out for free. And you can see we do a lot of different programs. We have a lot of different uh, teacher groups and stuff like that come out. Um, we've got reenactors that do uh, living history programs throughout the year. We've got interns, the, 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 the next generation of park rangers. You can see this is from an anniversary a couple of years ago. And um, by the way, I also do programs throughout Washington, DC, because there's a lot of Civil War history around DC, a lot of Civil War sites. So I did a sunset program. This is Logan Circle in Washington, DC. Um, so if you're ever interested in stuff like this, just let me know. We have a lot of different, um, a lot of different programs. Uh, there was a, a, this is managed by the Park Service as well. This is the African American Civil War Memorial by U Street. Uh, right across the street is the African American Civil War Museum as well. So, you know, um, I wanted to take advantage of DC's rich history. Um, so 
you know, if you've been to DC and you've seen all the, the circles that have the monuments to the general officers and stuff, I've been doing a lot of programs around there because a lot of the encampments and civil war sites are around there. And so here's a history at sunset program at Fort Stevens. And if you're lucky, you might, you might see Abraham Lincoln out there. You never know. And you, and you himself can tell the president to get down, you fool, okay? So that was one of, that was one of my best days. That was a lot of fun. Oh, okay, let, me, let me add one more thing. Okay, so I, I'm still in the process of getting this finalized, but um, I've had a lot of people come up to me after programs or, or contact us and because there were so many troops that came through D.C. or served in D.C. Uh, for the federal armies. If you had like an ancestor um, that served in D.C. and you've got images or information, please let us know. Uh, I've created this project called Faces of the Forts, and the idea is uh, uh, we'll have it on our website and our social media pages where uh, we can put a face to many of the, the people that served in D.C., right? Make it a lot more, uh, connect people to really the human side of the defenses of Washington. So um, if you've got, um, or, or, or if you know anyone uh, connected to the defenses of Washington um, that served in D.C. for any amount of time, uh, let us know, and we'd love to feature them as a part of the Faces of the Forts project. You can see my uh, email at the bottom of the page there and then our website as well. Walker, are there any questions? I have a question, Steve. Yeah. Does the National Park Service uh, maintain the earthworks fortifications? I mean, I would imagine there's a lot of deterioration. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we can get back to one of these images here. Um, like. This is a great image, right? Because you see the trees growing right through them. I mean, so what happens, you know, they, they cut down the trees, they, they built the walls up, they abandoned the fort and the trees grew right back through the wall, right? So yeah, we've, we've been working on earthwork stabilization. Um, one of our big things is to just to keep people off the walls, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, because in DC, uh, we didn't have that much signage up and people didn't even know what earthworks were. So a lot of it's education and telling people, you know, that this is a really important cultural and historic site. So we have people walk around the forts. We put signs up and some barriers as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, you can see a lot of the leaves that have fallen on top of the walls there. Leaf uh, cover is really important to preserving the earthworks itself. Um, we're a little bit nervous about some of the trees here because if the trees go down, it's gonna rip up a large section of the wall. So we work with our, uh, our natural resource team to, to kind of figure out what to do there as well. Uh, and we actually have done some restoration at uh, Battery Kimball. Uh, we've taken off some of the embrace, uh, some of the uh, invasive species on top of the walls to kind of clear it up. Um, we've taken out some of the dead trees that are near the fort as well to kind of give you a, a, a better um, sight line as well. But in many cases, we, we just want to leave the earthworks alone. That's, that's our best way of preserving them. Well, that's a great question. We do have one comment from our Facebook stream. Uh, Melissa Hacker Wynn, the director of photography ah, at of History course. Net, <laughs> uh, says, "Great shots, complimenting the photography." Well, uh, she's uh, she's wonderful, and we uh, we appreciate. Uh, she's done a lot for the defenses, and so has the uh, the publication and the and the two magazines as well. So, um, yeah, you know, so we have a lot of fun in the defenses of Washington. We are able to send an intern to the National Archives to um, to um, digitize the originating, original engineering blueprints of over 700 original blueprints. Hmm. So we've been able to uh, use GIS maps and superimpose them on the original blueprints. And we've been able to rediscover earthquakes that we thought were gone. So we've made what we call uh, rediscoveries, which has been really exciting. And we posted a link to those on our wall. So if you're interested uh, on our page, if you're interested in seeing the original blueprints, just let me know and I can send you the link, okay? This is a little off topic, um, but it's part of your expertise. Um, what have you found about Asians and Pacific Islanders participation in the Civil War? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, you know, and uh, so I was fortunate to be invited to be a part of this uh, MPS publication for the 150th and it's called um, Asian Pacific Islanders and the Civil War and it, it's, um, it's a really good study of it and I think it, I'm trying to remember the exact number, at least 60 that served in the federal armies. And um, more, much more, we believe, in the navies. And probably the most um, famous one is this gentleman named Joseph Pierce. He served at Chancellorsville in Gettysburg. Um, and that in itself tells you it's, it's hard to discern who these men are, right? Because his name was Joseph Pierce. And he was a, 
uh, sold to an American ship captain um, who was in China because, um, which was common in, in China because his, fa his family couldn't afford to basically raise him and take care of him, right? So he was brought to Connecticut and was uh, basically adopted by the community, given an American name, and served with the uh, served with the U.S. Uh, with the Federal Army during the Civil War. I, I actually traced where the regiment was at, and they were around um, the the defenses of Washington as well for an amount of time. But there were um, Asian and Pacific Islanders that served. Um, I mean, there were units out. I mean, there were guys from Hawaii, a lot, especially a lot on the West Coast. You know, the California area. And there were some that served in the Confederate armies and navies as well. So um, we're hoping to find more. You know, we've done um, as much research as we've could up to that point, because you know when you read some of these uh, service records, it says their name and it says like pale complexion. Well, pale can mean a lot of different things, right? And so um, we're hoping to um, to um, discover more. But I think um, what, you know, what we tried to do with that publication was just to reveal to the public that there were people from all different parts of the world that served in the armies, right, in the navies. We talk a lot about like the European soldiers, you know, the, the Germans and, mm -hmm. and uh, from other parts of Europe that served in the war. Well, there were some, you know, from the Southwest that served in those units, uh, you know, in the Trans-Mississippi Theater, uh, west of the Mississippi River, right, that had Hispanic or Mexican uh, descent. Um, and then we obviously had a, a ton of Native Americans that served. Mm -hmm. um, uh, soldiers from the Caribbean, you know, so um, Afro-Caribbean as well, and then people from um, Asia as well. I mean, the numbers we believe are fairly low, but we've been, been able to confirm um, several cases as well. So um, I was very proud to be a part of that publication, you know, because you kind of understand that the war was um, was very complex and there was a lot of people uh, affected by it. Thank you. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, I want to thank Steve. That was very interesting. Um, a lot of uh, great shots, as Melissa said. Um, and join us next month on October the 10th at one o'clock. And Melissa Hacker Wynn's going to be talking about John Rollins and his relationship with uh, Ulysses S. Grant. That's going to be exciting. Yeah, so I'd say, Diana, if you're I mean, that's what we're trying to, because um, I think people are so used to going to battlefields, you know, because you know when you're going to a battlefield, you see cannons and monuments and stuff. And in DC, the, the landscape has changed so dramatically, right? Um, right. That sometimes you walk by as something uh, historic and you have no idea what it is, right? And right. so one of the things that we've really worked on is really, especially when we, not only with uh, uh, school groups and children, but also with the public, uh, the importance of names so we talked about Totten. Everyone knows the Totten Metro Station. They have no idea that Fort Totten is right on top of the hill and it's still out there, right? Or, right. They, or they drive on Military Road. The Army built over 30 miles of military roads to connect all the forts during the Civil War. So people drive on Military Road and have no idea that it was a, formerly a Civil War road, right? So um, that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, you know, people think of DC and the monuments and the National Mall and all the federal buildings and stuff, but there's a ton of Civil War history here, of course. So, you know, if you're more, if there are people are more interested, just let us know and we'd be happy to, to connect them to our sites, okay? Okay. Thank you, friends. I appreciate um, you guys having me and see you soon. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Walker, we have, have a uh, question on chat here about um, these, this presentation being up on our website, made yes. available after. It, it will be, yes. Okay. You should be able to find this on the videos page of our Facebook page, uh, the, both the SB Post and the Carnegie Free Library. Okay, great. Yeah, there were, there were some great uh, graphics, Steve. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if, yeah, if, if anyone's got some uh, questions or they want to see, want to have a link to those images, let me know. Um, I generally take all the images from the Library of Congress. So, um, it, yeah, if, if anyone wants those, just let me know and I'll send them a link, okay? Okay. Thanks so much again, Steve. Yep, take care, everyone. See you all next month.